panel discussion is a very interesting one. It's about embedded education with technology. And let me introduce the esteemed panel for the day. Joining us from DigiTrends uh, is Mr. Zishan Rahman. He's the business manager. Sir, if you can please join us on stage. Ms. Fajar Rabia Pasha, the executive director at PAGE, done some amazing work with girls in education. Ms. Sumbul Manzoor, the head of center at ICE, ICE. Ms. Sumbul Manzoor, she's also the director of studies at ICE. Dr. Ali Raza Nemethi, the Group Director, Human Resource, International Operations and Marketing at iQualify. And last but not the least, Mr. Todd Shia, the founder of CDRS. I've learned that education is a very big aspect in everybody's lives. And as we have moved forward, technology has become a similarly omnipresent. So embedding education and technology together is something that we need to focus on. And I would like to start talking to my panelists here and understand what their views are on the future of education and as I mentioned the word ed tech. So that becomes the very big reality and especially post pandemic. And I think a lot of countries, including Pakistan, can view uh, the pandemic as, as uh, having a silver lining to a lot of things that kind of springboarded us, and especially our education system, into using much more technological platforms than we were using eight years ago. So, um, now I'd like to start with you. Uh, Ms. Fadda, right? So, right. You've been working actively in uh, education, and especially looking at the girls' education, and so how does uh, an institute or a platform for uh, educating learners start off with adapting to technological changes? Uh, thank you very much. I think adapting to technological changes is not uh, the challenge, really. I think because I think that's all to do with, uh, as an organization, it's a strategic decision that you make and you start sort of you know, taking actions against it. When you're talking about change, change is never easy. And we've seen that globally that, you know, whether that be UK, Europe, America, whenever they had to bring that change into their organizations and bringing technology and introducing technology has never been, you know, sort of um, uh, easy thing to say, you know, we would say, you know, you could develop these amazing databases and we can develop these uh, amazing LMSs and and we know that by use of technology, we, it's much easier to um, uh, monitor, you know, in terms of the impact that you're creating. Um, you have much more smarter system, meaning you are, your time is used much more wisely, your human resource time is used much more wisely. But uh, I think, you know, when it comes to um, human beings, uh, it's, it's a process um, and uh, and that's where, um, and I, I don't see this much happening in Pakistan, but in other countries we see that, you know, for example, if there's change to be brought in an organization and depending on the size of organization, there's a whole change management process that comes behind it. And I think that's what we need to think about when we're talking about technology as well and introducing technology. And uh, as you rightly said, you know, for example, within education, um, education was in crisis before COVID as well in Pakistan. But COVID gave us that opportunity to raise awareness and to make people understand how much problem and what a deep problem we have uh, in place uh, at the moment and, and this potential solutions as well using technology. So, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, it's an uh, um, introduction. I think, you know, from management level to strategic level is, is a decision making. Of course, there's a lot of resources involved, financial resources involved in introducing such changes. Uh, it's never easy in that sense, but then having a proper policy in place and a plan in place to engage the team members, um, your core team members to your national team members and how they're then trained 
and how they understand how um, use of technology can make can really improve our systems and processes. And obviously, because I talk about education, then what uh, I think you know within Pakistan's context, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later. There's a lot of work that can be done, can be achieved. We have huge problems with quality. We have a lot of problems. We have multiple level of problems, uh, which can be addressed through technology. Thank you. Right, absolutely. I think the biggest uh, uh, focus that we should have is adapting to the changes that, that you rightly mentioned and the scope in Pakistan that we need to be looking at. Um, Dishan Sab, I'll come to you about that as well. So, technology-aided instruction, what does that uh, mean to you and how do we actually make it something that is uh, relevant to everybody? Because we want the digital natives as the learners. They're very tech savvy, they're very tech driven. We already know that. The instructional side, which is us, which is the uh, education imparters, has it been a bigger challenge for us? Uh, uh, there is uh, a lot of talks about uh, the impact of digitization and education. Uh, technology with you know X field, Y field, but specifically if I talk about education, uh, I think uh, technology has a bigger role here to play. Uh, as every student, every individual who's sitting in front of a teacher has a different personality and different learning style and different personality trait. So uh, a teacher sitting in front of, I mean standing in front of 30, 40, 50 students cannot capture every personality trait. Learning is happening. Somewhere it's happening slow, somewhere it's happening faster. Some people, some students have a better IQ, some have low IQ. So I think this is where, uh, I mean, this is exactly where technology has to play its role. Because technology is something that should be leveraged here uh, in terms of delivering the instructions, uh, uh, if, if I talk about a case study that I have gone through, uh, a student learning over a platform for some mathematical problems uh, has to, you know, solve the problem on the portal, and that portal actually analyzes, analyzes and gives it. Uh, I mean, uh, exactly what the problem where he is just, you know, struggling. The next question that he's going to solve, or the next question that he's going to just, you know, uh, you know, attend. Is, is about his weakness. So the system analyzes its weakness and you know gives the next question according to that. Uh, instructions when it comes to you know uh, adopting technology, uh, you know a lot a lot has happened in, during COVID. Uh, online classes, um, online lectures, uh, attending more people. Um, uh, the same lecture can be attended mo by more people. Remotely, uh, you know, uh, accessibility has improved. So uh, I think that's where uh, the instructions, uh, instructional part, uh, technology has a bigger role to play. Yes. Thank you very much, Sankar. Yes, I would agree with that. So uh, when you talk about your examples, so that's actually relevant to how we can utilize AI in education, right? And within the education field, because uh, my background is in academia as well, so we are focusing now in the last few years on the need-based and the outcome-based curricula. When we talk about that, that identifies the learner needs first. Um, I'll, I'll give a uh, little bit of a uh, anecdote. So we, when we look at the history of academia, teachers or educationists used to be the sage on the stage, we used to call them that. They knew everything and the learners had no idea and they would impart the knowledge. Then they started to become the guide on the site, telling the students what to do, guiding them, um, focusing on directing them, navigating them towards the information. Now we're living in an age where there is a lot of information influx already. It's available for everyone. I don't have to get information for my learners. What I need to do is equip them how to think. So we are now the meddler in the middle. We're in the middle of the information and the learner. So that's the role that we're playing as academics. So um, Todd, I'm going to come to you about this. Um, how do we have that collective adaptability focused on the need base of a um, learner's development?
Oh, this question was for me? Uh, could you repeat that again? Well, <laughs> I think every panel should have an idiot on it, right? And, and I'm the one because I'm not an educationist. I'm not a digital expert. I'm a field worker in the mountains, in the plains, in the disaster zones of Pakistan for the last 17 years. So I, I, I give way to my esteemed associates here when it comes to the, uh, the technical aspects. But what I can say is we built several schools in places like Azad Kashmir where the, uh, the earthquake destroyed many schools and some places are still, uh, we're still building. We just built a school uh, and opened it last month because we were able to get funding. We've been able to build a few schools that had just never been rebuilt again. So we've been involved in that process. Um, we've also been in, involved in some telehealth um, uh, aspects of some of our clinics in the mountains and we've, we've utilized APNA like in, in America. So I think that like what APNA has done with our telemedicine, for instance, in SWAT at our Mother Child Health Center, I would like to see teachers, uh, maybe Pakistani Americans or others in America, be able to connect through technology with children in these mountains, uh, just like they have with some of the telehealth, maybe teleeducation. There could be some, some classes and some exchange of information. The other thing that I think would be really cool is not only for children, but also for adult literacy in some of these very remote areas, is if they all had a tablet that the government gave them to be connected, and it would serve, it may be all uploaded to a secure cloud, but then that would be able to help the teachers uh, uh, not only uh, teach better, but also uh, to, uh, to help them with their lesson plans and being more consistent across, you know, even remote areas where a lot of the education is um, not as good as perhaps in the cities. And so maybe it could even up the score a little bit where teachers would have more access through their tablets to be, uh, to, to grade their improvement and help them improve, as well as have the children and other people that maybe never had a chance to go to school in some of these areas to connect. And then there could be some pro education programs and curriculums that can follow their progress, find the students that are of particularly high and maybe uh, that would help uh, us identify some of the, the, the really, really intelligent, brilliant children out there in the mountains that, that can be given more resources. And then also just uplift the general population in their literacy, even in places where um, that's often where I've seen children that are working in the farms and fields, and their parents say, why would I educate them? I need them in the fields. You know, that what, what, they don't see the value in it. So these kinds of things, I think, could up, uplift the value in, in people's minds. I hope that made some sense. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, because you, you've touched on individualized learning, and uh, I think that's something very, very important. I think, you know, if we think about it in Pakistan's context, and if we really understand the value individualized learning can, be, you know, can bring to Pakistan and our growth, it's, it's tremendous, because you see, um, and use of technology to gear up towards individualized learning, because our teachers, for example, are not trained to assess a child's capability, interest, learning styles, you know, there's a lot of things which are involved in teaching. Unfortunately, our quality of education is very, very low. So uh, this is where EdTech can really play a huge role that if we can, if we're able to, you know, let's just say miraculously, as a country, we realize how important education is and we start to invest in technology, meaning we can give our teachers the tool to assess the child and move more towards individualized learning because we have a huge population. We've got one of the largest youth population. We've got, uh, uh, and that is a huge asset that we're wasting at the moment, which if is moved towards individualized learning, then rather than everybody's, you know, put on a standard education system, uh, we need to move away from that and really understand that because, I mean, we, you know, when we're working and as uh, Todd has said, we find children that, and girls and boys who are very street smart, never been to school. So when we bring them into our school systems, what we find is that they, uh, they progress so quickly. So we, I mean, our system is very sort of flexible in the, in the sense that 
we go with a child's um, um, you know uh, the capability in the classroom so our teachers are trained to deliver learning in a multi graded sort of session at the same time so i think that's something we can really really gear up towards uh, and that's would that would be a very smart investment to make as a country uh, that's something that where the government should invest in and really gives a give our teachers the you know facilitate our teachers to be able to assess the children and uh, and have individualized learning programs for them thank you uh, uh, can i add something okay. yeah uh, you know when when the uh, you know we talk about adapting technology it's actually uh, for sure all stakeholders needs to be on the same platform yes or on the same page yes, yes this is this is something that we all need to do uh, but the problem here is institutional implementation is one challenge teachers as uh, she mentioned are are you know somewhere very very far behind uh, from where they should be uh, ultimately students suffer so uh, you know from this all you know um, uh, picture i see that one of these stakeholder needs to uh, you know step up uh, it can be a teacher a teacher um, for example <clears throat> now students are are watching the videos before they attend the class so once you know the, the content has been available for long now it's teachers who actually are just you know guiding them how you can use technology to enhance your learning and that can be personalized learning as well i mean this is just a very very you know bottom line example but you know the content is available online the students are watching they are coming to the classes and they are actually having the impact the, the teacher is talking and they are that's that's making sense to them uh, the other thing that i am actually trying to mention here is that from this all aspect from these all the stakeholders one of them has to step up and i believe that the teachers uh, who can actually just you know do it in their own capacity if i am a teacher and i'm just you know all thinking about my students i would definitely do something that that at least i can do i mean i can just you know refer some websites i can content i can refer some gamification online available that's what actually needs to be done because if you go from you know government point of view that something will happen a miracle will happen so we'll wait for the miracle for whole our life come to the infrastructure uh, the, uh, requirements as well but yes you I, i would start off with the last point that you made the individual boundaries that we need to push so one person at a time um but the bigger thing that you touched upon is uh, the potential that every learner has the intrinsic potential that can be uh, tapped into as you as ford mentioned there are brilliant children in areas where they don't have any services or tools or devices but even then they have that innate ability to actually have that intelligence uh, um channel properly towards education so that's something that we need to do so embedding technology is basically the the weaving of the tools the devices and the systems as well as the capabilities so we need to have a, a bigger network in terms of developing the human capital and then it all comes back to how we develop individuals the skills based individuals that we need in pakistan now um i'm sure those of you who were here yesterday we had a lot of talks about the digitization and the utilization of information technology and that's something that is going to be at the crux of everything that we do in the next Uh, coming decades as well and it's going to be rapidly enhancing the ability of humans to function in different diverse environments as well so i'm going to now refer to the hr specialist that we have with us about how are we embedding that technological um depth seeming uh, into the education system and the ultimate goal needs to be the evolution of the human capital so how do we identify the trends that are right for each learner and how do we make sure that they become skilled individuals well thank you sambal and of course i've got a uh, lovely uh, uh, panel with me of course with great intellect and acumen so they've covered you know basic things for digital things uh, i would like to talk about three uh, basic facets uh, you know uh, ms sambal has talked about one is the employer one is the learner second is third is the learning intervention so if i give you of a ballpark idea about how this has changed post pandemic uh, this has changed dramatically uh, as an employer if i talk as an employer 
An employer now does not need only the degree. They need skill set. You know, uh, uh, on, a, on a lighter note, log ye bolte hain ki ji nokri nahi hai. I say, you know, we, I do not get the right people to hire, right? You know, if I, if I need to hire a content writer, the person needs to know that, of course, how to write a content. And of course, if we talk that how does it change, how did, like, you know, it's all changed uh, digitally, post-pandemically, now people are forcing on a uh, learning skill set. Um, I've seen a dramatic change for a hype in people becoming an entrepreneur. So if I talk very openly, right? You know, how many entrepreneurs do we have in this hall, right? Uh, if you if you raise your hands, okay. So entrepreneurs, right? So uh, there can be three main reasons. You know, if I talk about uh, what Beringer talks about, three main reasons to become an entrepreneur. One is need for independence. You want to be independent. You don't need to report to a boss. You don't need to come work from nine to five. Uh, one is need for achievement. You don't need to be called son of Malik, son of X Y Z, son of this. So you need to be, achieve something, right? And third is financial rewards. You cannot become a billionaire doing a job, right? So, you know, this, these are the three basic uh, things, you know, that make you an entrepreneur. However, now, before COVID, people were frightened about become, uh, the fact that, of course, they can become an entrepreneur because they never knew that, of course, they can become an entrepreneur without an investment. So now, the, the students we have, the, um, what employers see, is two kinds of students. One, they need to jump in a job, but second is they need to jump in entrepreneurship. So now, what has embedded into both is skill set. So uh, the learning interventions now made it easier. Now we at iQualify UK, we'll believe in blended learning, believe in skill sets, believe in, uh, believe in embedding the right skill set for the people, of course, needed by an employer. So this digital transformation has done a trick to us that, of course, they have made it easier for us to identify people, the human capital, and also for the students to learn the right skill set available in the market. Uh, the reason right now uh, it got easier is uh, the, the fear the people usually had before in their mind for having online learning, right? You know, I, I, I remember approximately a 10 years back when I was hiring people, we never used to give weightage to those universities who were online, right? So, now, we do give weightage to blended learning, to online learning, to distance learning. And this, you know, what iQualify also does, of course, they bring in the right education to Pakistan, of course. And now, it's not only Pakistani education. This is now a global world. You can learn from any of the country, any of the thing, you know, city, from any university, right sitting in Pakistan. So, for digital transformation has brought a different learning intervention paradigms to the society now. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ali. So, um, yes, building on the same things, the actual um, conceptualization of a digital world is based on the use of technology, but we need to develop the ecosystem. So we were touching upon the, um, the subject about how we need to develop the capacity and the capabilities and the infrastructure. So I'm going to come back to you to talk about that. Um, if you would like to let us know about what kind of uh, efforts do we need in um, far-flung area, especially, in order to reach a bigger audience of the learners, especially relevant to the technological infrastructure that we should have, and to develop that ecosystem with local communities and the teacher training capacities that we need to work on. Well, uh, when, when I first started, started working up in SWAT, and, and uh, we had our health clinic there, um, between the, uh, the time of the, uh, the war in, in SWAT and then right next year was the floods and we were working in that area and then we started a mother and child health center there. There was, uh, at that time, only very, very slow dial-up uh, to get online. Uh, so the way that we did telemedicine was just through emails and sending... Um, uh, we could send, it was even difficult to send a photo. So it was mostly text about what's going on with the patient. We'd send it to the specialist in America and, and they would, you know, it'd go back and forth. Over the years, I've seen it. Now we have, uh, up in the mountains of SWAT, we have this high-speed DSL uh, available and, and internet is, so I've seen the evolution of the, uh, of being able to, uh, to do a lot more and, and, and have much better, uh, you know, uh, services 
And I think that obviously that goes to education too. I, I, I would like to see um, perhaps um, uh, the world community as well as the Pakistan government um, bring more uh, of the kinds of, I think there was, Elon Musk was gonna put up satellites or balloons so that there was internet everywhere. You know, I think that these kinds of things, they can also have a blessing and a curse, but the good side of it is that, you know, everybody can be connected and everybody can have access to those digital highways. So in the, in the northern areas where I work, plus in, I've uh, been in some of the floods areas, flood areas down in Sindh and Balochistan recently, um, where there still is no connectivity at all in terms of like anything that where, where a device works. So I think that, that definitely we're a little bit still behind in many uh, areas to, to even get basic um, uh, infrastructure and services so that technology, the technology can even be utilized fully by the whole country and equally. So I'd like to see that, and I, I hope that the Pakistan government um, gets very serious about putting devices in the hand of every child and every person who wants to learn and setting up the proper infra infrastructure because it's absolutely doable and, and the technology exists in, in the world to be able to do it, but I don't see it everywhere here. Right, so the access to technology, yes, of course, that's going to be the biggest denominator in enabling um, ed tech and the scope of ed tech reaching to different areas in Pakistan. Okay, um, Mr. Rabi, I'd like to come back to you about that. Um, how big of a role do you think that embedded technology can play in training students in the 21st century skills? What's the question? Training, training students. Yeah, so, um, well, of course, you see, I think, you know, we are a global sort of a community now, and and I think, you know, um, for us to be, and, and, you know, when we're looking at job market and maybe in, in entrepreneurship, and it requires multiple level of skill sets, and... Uh, I think, you know, uh, with the kind of content that is available now online, um, a lot of content available from uh, global universities, especially on soft skills, uh, again, which we don't pay, I think, you know, in Pakistan, we don't pay much attention to um, like teamwork, conflict resolution, um, uh, communication skills, problem solving, and, uh, and you know, like, uh, um, uh, already mentioned here when when you when I'm an employer and I have people coming in working for us the most they may have technical skills but then they and uh, it's um, and that behavior and attitude is equally important to the technical skills that you have learned so I think you know that's where um, you know access to internet access and that kind of exposure globally through technology can really bring that change in the, and we are constantly talking about that, you know, we really need to change the mindset of our people. Unless we change the mindset of people, we're not really going to move forward. So you could talk about technology, but if we're not changing in terms of, you know, like I said before, how this technology can really help us improve our own systems. And it can't be about, uh, you know, uh, reducing jobs for people, but people need, we need to be flexible and adaptable in terms of what new skill sets we need to learn. And, uh, and that may be towards, and being more smarter. So use of AI, for example, is so amazing, is so powerful. There's just so much that can be done. And, uh, um, uh, but we need to have better leadership skills. We need to have better management skills. We need to have better communication skills. And, uh, and how do we, uh, how we don't become robots ourselves and be still being that being human, but using these very important skills to do that. And that's why I think, you know, uh, again, online education that is there already uh, can play a huge role. And, uh, and, and we see some amazing work that's been done globally that can be, uh, just needs intro introducing. And just, just you know, um, an example I wanted to share. To, I was on a program once and, um, and I, 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 we were sort of talking about different case studies around use of technology and how that can really change uh, things. So 
So one, uh, you know, somebody tested out this model where they put a computer somewhere far flung in, in, I can't remember, globally somewhere, in hilly areas where the whole village was uneducated, no literacy, no computer literacy, no digital skills at all. And they just leave this computer connected to internet there. And, and that's it. They don't do anything. They don't, tell even, they don't even tell people. They don't tell children. And a month later, they come and see, they come back, the team come back and see how all the children in the community are engaged on that computer, going online, and they've explored themselves. So we are so, our children now are so much tech savvy that, you know, you don't even, you just need to give them a device and access to internet. And I think, you know, they can learn those soft skills. And given the scale of problems we're facing, not just in Pakistan, but globally, I think we need to understand how uh, s smartly we can work now by just introducing this very important, you know, we can't survive without technology anymore. Thank you. To add something like, uh, very, very well summarized, right? So uh, if I uh, talk about uh, one thing, right? Uh, that is we have uh, broken psychological barriers, rather cultural barriers. Uh, I remember, right, you know, we used to admire, you know, my, my family used to admire the son of someone, you know, getting this much GPA, right? This much, these are marks in metric or, or in FSC or in bachelor's, right? And GPA, and the person used to tell proudly that, of course, I'm this much GP out of this in interviews. And I, if I remember, I've conducted around 20,000 interviews. I never asked somebody to tell marks or GPAs or any grade. So this is the psychological barrier we have broken, broken now, this, this uh, technology, and especially being very uh, pertinent about one fact, that imagine a person who has got four out of four GPA and the person is of around two GPA. And the four, if the person having four out of four may not be able to perform the task and a person who has given you an assignment can do, of course that person, that person becomes useless. Of course, if, if, I, if I take an example of Fiverr, all freelance platforms, of course, the person who might have got less GPA with better skill set is more preferred over a person with a higher GPA and less skill set. So, so, so I, I just heard that, uh, you know, I, obviously my, uh, you know, uh, friends here talked about, uh, about the 21st century skills. Uh, I always thought that you cannot produce uh, mangoes from an apple tree. So you cannot uh, develop 21st century skills from a 19th century educational setup. So. Uh, so, so this is something. हम सब यहाँ बैठे हुए हैं, हम सब ने कुछ न कुछ education हासिल की है, और यहाँ पर किसी न किसी के contribution की, चाहे वो parents हों, चाहे वो teachers हों, चाहे वो हमारे uh, you know uh, uncles हों, किसी न किसी के contribution की वजह से हम जो है वो यहाँ पर हैं, आज हम सब जो audience में भी हैं और हम यहाँ पर भी, so so ये अगर contribution अगर आप recap करें, देखें पीछे जाके कि यार किसने contribute किया, so you would find that it was a drive that was pushed into yourself. Kisi ne drive push kiya, kisi ne aap ko push kiya, and you actually realized, yes, I'm far behind and I need to go ahead. Uh, uh, coming back to 21st century skills, collaboration, team building, problem solving. Bhai, aap padha rahe hain Tilum. Is it called Marshall Tilum Social Studies? Aap padha rahe hain Sindhi. Aap padha rahe hain English. आप बच्चे को क्लास में दूसरे बच्चे से बात करने की ज़्यादा तक नहीं देते हैं। So I mean you are talking about collaboration. So I think entrepreneurship, young entrepreneurship, young entrepreneur programs in schools is a must thing for 21st century skills. If we really are thinking, if we are really serious, यानी मैं as a parent, I want my school, मैं अपने बच्चों के स्कूल में जा के उनको ये बता रहा हूँ ये खुदा का वास्ता है आप ऑन्ट्रप्रेन्योरशिप के छोटे-छोटे प्रोग्राम शुरू कीजिए ताकि इन बच्चों को पता तो लगे ये होता कि कि चुड़िया का नाम है क्या बट सो वी एक्चुअली एस पेरेंट्स एस एस हैंडलर्स और ऑफ़ आर किड्स नीड टू पोश अ स्कूल्स कि वो ऑन्ट्रप्रेन्योरशिप के प्रोग्राम शुरू करें ताकि Absolutely, very, very relevant to um, the state of education in Pakistan. We are, uh, as you rightly pointed out, we, we're, we're a few centuries behind. I'm hoping not a few centuries, maybe a few decades uh, in reality. But uh, we tend to be averse to change as a nation. That's what I, I've uh, come to see. That we uh, try and 
retain the uh, status quo for everything, whether it's uh, in any kind of a uh, sector, whether it's education, whether it's technology, whether it's uh, any of the other areas as well. But the, that curiosity in terms of using technology is something that we now need to actively build up in the learners' minds and especially the teachers' minds as well. So that's where my next uh, question is going to go. Okay. All right. And that's going to be the last thing that we covered. That is going to be looking at the teacher trainings and the scope of teacher trainings and the capacity building because the learner curiosity is going to be there. But as uh, Dishan have said, we, we don't let students talk to each other in class. We have a very regimented education system. It's all about uh, paint by numbers, go within the lines. We don't let them explore things until your undergrad, which is your um, 20 years of education, or even your postgrad, which is beyond that, you are not let out of the box. And that is probably a bigger disadvantage to any learner. So we need to look at how do we uh, help the teachers first look at the bigger picture, and how do we build up their capacity. So uh, I'm going to come back. <laughs> Because you're actively working with a lot of teachers as well, maybe some success stories that you have about the capacity building for teachers? Okay. First of all, I would say that teachers are our most important asset in Pakistan because we have huge crisis. We have uh, uh, millions of teachers who require that training and capacity building. We have this old mindset that still exists when you walk into a classroom, we're talking about, you know, teachers don't allow. It's a very set, you know, um, uh, 18th century mindset, memorization. There's no, we don't develop thinking critical skills, et cetera, in children. So what we need to do is, is really, really invest in our teachers and, and use that technology to, to, to give them access to this global content that we have where they can really create rich learning experience for students in classrooms, right? Um, so in terms of, you know, uh, uh, success stories, for example, that we see, now we have, we employ female teachers, majority of our teachers are female teachers coming from far from villages working within their own communities. So it's always a challenge that, um, <clears throat> like, let's just say you are in Balochistan, in Chagli, um, and, uh, you know, you may have, a, you identify teachers from there, or we have, you know, multiple schools in very, very far-flung areas where there is lack of internet or very poor inf internet in infrastructure available. Uh, you find really good committed people who really want to um, educate their children in the communities. And that's a good thing that we have as a, as, as a nation. Uh, but they don't have this training. So what we have done is, um, you know, we, uh, during, just before COVID actually, uh, we did a whole mapping exercise with all our teachers to see who actually owns a smartphone, who has access to internet, who may have a laptop or a tablet, etc. And once we've done that, um, A, we uh, facilitated our teachers in terms of having additional devices. Um, and then we uh, created a whole training programs for them. So like I said, you know, within our school system, it's a very flexible learning model. It's, a, it's called an ALP model, where uh, uh, we would go into a village and uh, assumingly that nobody in that village is educated. Um, but then we find that children are very street smart. We find our girls are very, very smart. And when they come in, they, we, we had, um, they may be at different learning levels. So, but our resources are very tight, so we may have one classroom, that's our set model, one classroom, one teacher, and you may have 40 students sitting there, but all at different level. Now what we can't do is we, do, we, have, we don't have enough teachers in these areas, so we have to find that one person that we can really train. So using technology, what we've been able to do is, and not just technology, but on uh, sort of physical training as well, is to train our teachers on multi-grade teaching. So you could be in a classroom, but you can deal with children who are at different learning levels and with different learning styles as well. And that has made a huge impact because we know within a year to a year, our children, ha they can read, they can write, their, uh, their numeracy skills have improved and we measure all of these because obviously they go through them, their own assessment process, etc. And uh, just because of investing in our teachers, what we're finding
So by um, investing in our teachers and giving them the right training and the skill set, what we're doing is that we're reducing that time uh, we would normally take in a mainstream education system. Uh, so let's just say a child might have to do five years of learning in a school system before they can complete primary education. In our system, in less than three years, our children can complete primary education. So that is because of course, you know, the curriculum, but more importantly, how the teachers are trained and then how they deliver that learning in that classroom. And that's what we need. You know, when we have, when we say we nearly have 23, 24 million children who are not going to school in Pakistan, one of the largest in the world, you can imagine the crisis we have. And, uh, and same thing happens with the quality for the children who are in schools. If we go in government schools, you will be shocked that you go in, a, in, in fifth class, for example, you walk in, and the child still can't read and write, you know, after spending five years. So that is the quality of education. So investing in our teachers is hugely important and can really, really help us address our education crisis in Pakistan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Fajarabia. So yes, very um, aptly put that you have to invest in the capacity for our teachers because they are the uh, people responsible for the learner development within the classrooms and even outside the classrooms, the guidance that they provide. Okay. So I think we're at the end of the panel discussion. I'd just like to thank all my panelists and their views as well. So uh, thank you very much, Todd. So we, did, we have we've focused on a lot of important things, I think, but we just kind of touched on the surface of a lot of very big issues as well about how we need to have a rehabilitation system within Pakistan, within the areas which don't have that infrastructure yet, and especially focusing on the adult learning as well that you mentioned. We could have talked about that more, but maybe we'll get a chance to do that later on. Because I don't want to waste this. Uh, right, for, right person for the right job is very, very important. It's critical. When we are companies, we actually just you know, put a lot of efforts, money and all that we are going to choose the right person. And if there is a wrong person in the company, mein, so that actually just you know, hurts the company setup, ecosystem. मुझे ये बात कहने में बिल्कुल कोई हेजिटेशन नहीं है कि हम टीचर्स को हायर करते हुए इतनी एफर्ट नहीं करते, ठीक है? So right person for the right job, yeah, right person for the right job, we actually need to have a benchmark, at least a framework, a national framework. A teacher needs to qualify to be a teacher. A teacher needs to have that trait, जिसको बच्चे को कुछ सिखाना है, उसकी इसके पैशन में होना चाहिए. Unless, until, you know, this would be, you know, we would be talking and, you know, you know there, there would be a lot of talks, but, you know, uh, outcomes uh, would be just, you know, somewhere far. Thank you. We're doing our bit for that. I'll just end with that. Teacher training ke baat ki So we are basically a UK-based hire organization. I qualify UK as my parent company. When we came to Pakistan, we realized that certification training nahi hai Pakistan. I can go work in a school, at a university, at a college without any certificates. So we are the first people to launch that. So we are trying to make our uh, contribution and we have a postgraduate certificate in teaching for the teachers in Pakistan. And we are training public colleges and universities and schools and trying to make that difference. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Dishan Saab. Thank you, Ms. Fajarabia. Thank you, Dr. Ali and Thought. So wonderful talking to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. Uh, the esteemed panelists, I will now call upon Mr. Kamal Masroor uh, to come present uh, tokens of appreciation for our esteemed panelists. Um, very, very thought-provoking comments made today. And I'm so glad we got to see a bit of transnational education, um, and we got to see um, the work that is being done in the development se sector, ed tech, and uh, teachers training, which is a very big component, and uh, definitely one that the government needs to focus on as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the panel and Mr. Kamal Masroor. So, our first acknowledgement is for um, Ms. Sumbul Manzoor, the head of center at ICE. Thank you, ma'am. Great job with the moderation, madam.
Thank you. And ma'am, can you, if you can please just remain seated, we'll take a group photo later. Uh, next one is for Mr. Zishan Rahman, the business manager at DigiTrends. Some hard hitting facts shared by him. Thank you so much, Mr. Zishan. Next, I'd like to acknowledge Ms. Fajr Rabia Pasha, the executive director of PAGE. Right, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Fajr Rabia Pasha. Next up, we have Dr. Ali Raza Nemethi, the Group Director, Human Resource, International Operations and Marketing at iQualify. So ICE is a project of iQualify, and Dr. Ali Raza Nemethi has been associated with education for many years now. And thank you for your contributions to the panel. And last but not the least, um, Todd Shea, the founder of CDRS. Thank you for all the impactful work that you've done in Pakistan. Now, if we can just take a group photograph, please. Group photo with all the panelists. If uh, I'd request you all to please stand up. If I can please request you to remain on stage, we have uh, an excellence award to give out. Thank you, ma'am.